Hello everyone. This is Derek Gillespie. In a continuation of a series specifically created for members of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. In this video presentation, it is my intention to address a very quizzical quotation from Mrs. White as it relates to Jesus being the equal Son of God. A quotation that at times has caused several members of the church to be led astray by dissidents in our midst, dissidents who are opposed to the church's teaching on the Trinity of the separate beings of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being co-equal and co-eternal members of the Godhead and who together are our God. A quotation that they normally point to to try to undermine this teaching is a quotation that I'm now going to address and I'm going to bring together several passages and quotations from Mrs. White and our pioneers so that we can have a better appreciation for what this quotation really is about. Let me now bring on screen that quotation. Now, on screen, if you look in the center of the screen, you will see an highlighted section of the quote that I'm going to address. And it is this bothersome quote which many seem not to understand the context of it and they are easily led astray by the dissidents in our midst. Let me read what the highlighted section says. God is the Father of Christ. Christ is the Son of God. To Christ has been given an exalted position. He has been made equal with the Father. All the counsels of God are opened to his Son. This is taken from Testimonies, Volume 8, page 268. Now, Normally what the dissidents do, they pull out this section of the, of the passage, highlight it, and use it to say, well, there you see, Jesus was not always in existence. He was not always equal with the Father because to him was given an equal position with the Father. There you have it, they say. Jesus obviously is not by natural rights and natural inherent quality from all eternity past, co-equal with the Father. But there was a time when he never existed and hence was given this equality with the Father. One of the things I've always learned about, whether it be a quotation from a writer that is a writer that is not in the Bible, or a writer that is in the Bible, the first thing you need to do is to determine the context of what the quotation is all about. So what do you do? You read above and you read below that quoted statement or line or sentence so that you can see the full picture from which that quotation was drawn. And what the dissidents normally do, they totally ignore the context above and below this quotation and build a doctrine around it which end up misleading our brethren. And oftentimes our brethren do not take the time to study for themselves. And so here we go. You want to understand what this context is? 
let's read the entire everything that's on screen i'm going to read so you can see the context dear listener notice ellen white starts out by quoting hebrews 1 verses 1 to 5 at the top of the screen i'm reading god who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son what's the context in these last days since jesus became incarnate is what this passage this whole quotation is about and i will you will see for yourself as i read as i continue to read have in these last days spoken to us by his son which son is that the incarnate son and you'll see clearly as we go along whom he hath appointed here of all things by whom he made the words so here paul is switching back and forth he's focusing on the incarnate son whom the father is now speaking to us or through him in these last days and he switches back to the past when it was the same incarnate son but of course who existed in another form who made the worlds on behalf of the father and by switching back to that past obviously from everlasting he now focuses on that son who being the brightness notice the present continuous tense it is a tense which suggests it was always the case from all eternity who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person in other words the exact copy of the person of the father in everything that the father is this son who is no one incarnate son but in the past was the brightness of the father's glory the express image of his person this son upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself now paul switches back to this son when he became incarnate when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand when did he do that after he became man and as the messiah he purged our sins by giving himself on the cross he then as the son incarnate son sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high ellen white continues to quote hebrews 1 verse 3 being made so much better than the angels here the incarnate son is being compared to the angels in other words the man who became someone without reputation without powers powers even lesser than the angels ellen white told us philippians 2 tells us that the son emptied himself and made himself of no reputation it is this son that was now being made much better than the angels so quoting paul ellen white continues when he had himself purged our sins obviously as the incarnate son sat down on the right hand of majesty on high as the incarnate son being made so much better than the angels as the incarnate son he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they as the incarnate son and we want to prove it that it was the incarnate son that was being spoken to for unto which of the angels said he the father at any time thou art my son this day have i begotten thee in other words the father is looking at someone who is already in existence and saying this day have i begotten thee which day could not be in eternity because from all everlasting past jesus has been in existence the same mrs white tells us he was always there from all eternity fellowshipping with the father and since of course eternity has no beginning and the bible tells us in hebrews 7 verse 3 that this son has no beginning of days therefore for the father to say to the son this day have i begotten thee this was reference to the incarnate son 
and again I will be to him a father and he shall be my son. In other words, the father did not look at any of the angels who were already in existence and say, this day have I begotten thee. But he looked at the divine son that was already in existence and in the context of Jesus becoming the incarnate son, the messianic son, the father now in time, because it is this son who in time he's speaking to us in these last days. The father said to him in time, this day have I begotten thee. Just as God looked at the, 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 the kings of Israel like David for instance. And when they became king on the throne, it was that day that the father looked at them and or looked at David and other kings of Israel and said, this day have I begotten thee. So, Jesus becoming the human son, another a son in a new sense, Mrs. Selen White tells us. This day the father looked at the son when he became the incarnate son and said, this day have I begotten thee. Now, we want to prove that all of the context of the quotation we're focusing on is about the, the incarnate son. The son who emptied himself, became of no reputation, became like one of us. And it was the son that the father is now going to make equal with himself. I'm going to prove it to you by reading the rest of the passage on screen in front of you. So you don't think that I am trying to mislead you. Let me continue to read. Notice. In the context of this son who the father is now speaking to us in these last days. Who became one of us. The son who in time the father looks up to him and say, this day have I begotten thee. He became the son of God in a new sense. The earthly son. It was this son now that the father is looking at him. And giving him an exalted position. Read Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through to 11. And you will see the same thought being brought out. The son became of no reputation on earth. And the father then exalted this man. To a position of equality with himself. So that at the name of this man. Jesus the Christ. The human son. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord, Yahweh, Kurios, Jehovah, to the glory of God the Father. So, it is in that context, Ellen White, quoting the Son of God who became the human Son in a new sense. Begotten in time, thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Because eternity doesn't have a beginning point or a day in it when Jesus became the Son of God. So it was in, in, in human terms, within time, that the Father looked at a pre-existent Son and said, This day have I begotten thee. Because the Father never looked at any of the pre-existing angels and said that. He looked at his pre-existing divine Son and in that context referred to him in the messianic terms. And then Ellen White drops in that bothersome quote, which many have taken out of context and not bother to read the, the, the verses, the, the lines before and the lines after. Notice she says, God is the father of Christ. Christ is a son of God. In what context? The context we just read above, where this son became a son of God in a new sense, an earthly sense. To Christ, in other words, the man. I'm, I'm going to read it, read the rest of the passage and you'll see it for yourself. God is the father of Christ, the man. Christ is the son of God, the man. To Christ, the man has been given an exalted position. Philippians 2 verses 7, 8 through to 11. That's the man that is exalted to a position of equality with the Father. He has been made, notice, made equal. Jesus is not a, a 
creature originally, but as a man, he's a creature with powers less than the angels, Ellen White tells us. And it is as this creature that he was made equally father. All the causes of God are open to his son. Open to the son as the incarnate Christ. Notice now the context as Ellen White continues to, to, to write about this human son. Jesus said to the Jews, My father worketh hitherto and I work. The son can do nothing of himself. Who is Jesus? Who, who, which son is Jesus speaking of? The son on earth who everything he had to depend on his father to do. The son can do nothing of himself but what he see the father doeth. For what things soever he doeth, these things also doeth the, the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. All of this is in the context of the Son on earth. He, 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 here again, Ellen White continues, is brought to view the personality of the Father and the Son, showing the unity that exists between them. This unity is expressed also in the 17th chapter of John in the prayer of Christ for his disciples. Prayer of Christ, the human Christ, praying for his disciples. The human Christ looking at the Father above and saying, You are the only true God and I am Jesus whom you have sent. Who is this Jesus? The man on earth. And yet, if you will notice, before Jesus became man on earth, Ellen White pointed to this divine son who appeared in the fire among the three Hebrew boys and declared that this divine son is who the three Hebrew boys confessed as their only true God. So therefore, it was this son on earth speaking as a condescended human who points to his father above and said, you are the only true God and I am Jesus, the man, the creature whom you have sent. She continues, this unit is expressed also in the 17th chapter of John in the prayer of Christ for his disciples. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou father art in me. Notice the father art in me. When Christ was on earth, the father is in him as a man. Via the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is only through the presence of the Holy Spirit in Jesus as a man that he was able to do any of the father's works. Raise the dead. Work miracles. And so Jesus said neither pray for these alone but for them also which shall be shall believe on me through their word that they may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee in other words showing a principle of unity and that they may also be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me i have given them all of the entire, um, everything on screen is referring to the human son with just references here and there as quoted from Paul in Hebrews 1 to 5 about his past divine existence. But the entire passage here is about the human son that was exalted to a position of equality with the father, made equal with him as a creature. And now, as a creature in heaven, all the counsels between this man and God the Father, the counsels is open to him in the heaven, the counsels. That's the context of the passage. And you may say, okay, didn't Ellen White speak of Jesus in another context before he came to earth? As being ordained to be equal with the Father Himself? Let's go to that passage. Alright, so here on screen we have from the book The Great Controversy. And if you recall, there were two versions of this book. 
the 1911 version, the later version, and the 1888 version. Um, so from the great controversy, Ellen White makes plain that in heaven, Jesus who was apparently rubbing shoulders with the angels as a means of showing them what God is like, he appeared to them as one of them, as one of the angels, though he was not a creature like them, though he was not a literal angel like them. And so based on this divine arrangement of Jesus manifesting the features of the God and the character of the God among the created beings of heaven, Satan decided to use this to mislead the angels to think, the rest of the angels rather, to think that Jesus was not deserving of having full rights of the Godhead, having right to counsel with the Father, and, and they don't have that privilege. And so the Father called the heavenly host together to let them know what was the truth of Jesus' natural rights from all eternity past. Notice Ellen White says, The great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might, in the presence of the angels, confer special honor upon his son. Not meaning that it was the first time that the son is going to get this honor. No, it was simply meaning that this was when they were going to be made, the angels would be made to understand the true reality from all eternity past. The son was seated on the throne with the father. Same son who Ellen White says he is co-equal with the father and they are together the deity. God in the highest sense. God overall, blessed forevermore, both on the same throne, are the God of the universe, the deity, capital D-E-I-T-Y. So the son was seated on the throne with the father, and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The father made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ his son should be equal with himself, so that whatever, that wherever was the presence of his son, it was as his own presence the word of the son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the father his son he had invested with authority to command the heavenly host especially was his son to work in union with himself in the anticipated creation of the earth and every living thing that should exist upon the earth his son would carry out his will and his purposes but would do nothing of himself alone in other words, he would not act independent of the Father. They would always act in unison. The Father's will would be fulfilled in him. So here we have the Father now explaining to the angels that though Jesus appeared to them as seemingly an angel like themselves, yet this was just part of God's plan. As Ellen White said elsewhere, it was part of God's plan. And this plan suggests that Obviously, this is how divine the divine design would want the Godhead to be made known to creatures. First creatures in heaven and then later creatures on earth. That the Son would be among them as if one of them literally and would display the character of the Godhead. So this was God's, this was the design of the Godhead from all eternity past. Now, another curious reader will look at the statement and say, okay, if the far, it was ordained by, the, by, by God himself that Christ would be equal and was invested with authority, then obviously it would suggest that there was a time when Jesus never existed. 
there was a time when he was not equal with the father because he was not in existence to be equal with the father. And this now is where we need to look at the big picture and other quotations from Mrs. White and look at the understanding of the other pioneers around her about, first of all, who God is and, of course, who Jesus is. So, what we need to do, first of all, is to consider if according to Mrs. White, Jesus has existed from all eternity as a distinct person and there was never at any time, whether in created time or in eternity before time was created, when he was not in fellowship. Fellowship suggests that you have to be separate from who you're fellowshipping with. There was never at any point from all eternity past when Jesus was not a distinct person in fellowship with the Father. Because of because this boggles the mind to think that a, a son who is begotten of the Father could be there all along, always fellowshipping with the Father. No wonder Mrs. White had to say in 1905 that the oneness of the Son with the Father is something that is a mystery. It boggles the mind to try to, to wrap your mind around that reality. How could a son be always there, distinct from the father, from all eternity past, fellowshipping with him? And so she says this truth is in light unapproachable and is incomprehensible. We can't explain it. Because we would have thought that a son who is begotten of the father, there must have been some point when he didn't exist. Well, the Bible tells us, and Mrs. White tells us, in the words that she uses, that this is not so. There was never any point when Jesus was not a distinct person existing from all. Notice the word all. All does not lend itself for you to say, well, there was a point when. No, from all eternity past simply means just as the Father himself has always been in existence from all eternity past, so has the Son been in existence beside him as a distinct person. So the question then is, when was Jesus invested with authority? When was it ordained by, the, by God himself for Jesus to be equal with the Father? You want me to tell you from when? From as long as the Father himself has been in existence. This is a natural order of things. Because that's what from all eternity past means. As long as the Father himself has been in existence the very existence of the father as an eternal father makes it a natural reality of the universe that his eternal son who is alongside him from all eternity past in himself as the father from eternity past from all eternity past it naturally means that in the son who is beside him it is naturally naturally the case that the, the son would be equal with the father. So by the very existence of the father himself as an eternal father. One who as an eternal father has no beginning. And has existed from all eternity past. That father's very existence as an eternal father. Makes it the natural reality that his eternal self-existent son beside him. Always in existence. Is naturally equal with himself as well that's what it means for it to for the father to for to to ordain that the son will be equal with himself there was never at any point in eternity that the father was not the father and if he's the father the, it means that the son was always there for him to be the eternal father 
The word eternal has a meaning without beginning, without end. So there was never a point when the father was not the father. And there was never a point in eternity when the son was not the son. And by the very presence of the father existing as an eternal father, by the natural order of reality, the son would be equal to himself. That's what it means that it was ordained by himself. In other words, the son is naturally a part of the father. And the very existence of the eternal father makes the existence of the eternal son one that is co-equal with him. And you may say, huh? The son being a part of the father? Oh yes, let me prove it to you that same author, Mrs. White, makes plain that the son is a part of the father himself. Let's prove it. Here on screen, I brought up a quotation from 1888 materials written by Mrs. White. Hear what she says. I'm reading from the top of the screen. Who can anticipate the gifts of infinite love? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have it her everlasting life. God's love for the world was not manifested because he sent his son. But because he loved the world, he sent his son into the world that divinity clothed with humanity might touch humanity. And while divinity lays hold of infinity, let me read that again. God's love for the world was not manifested because he sent his son. But because he loved the world, he sent his son into the world that divinity clothed with humanity might touch humanity. And that is happening while divinity lays hold of infinity. Now notice very carefully. Though sin had produced a gulf between man and his God. Now we're going to come back to these two terms. Man between man and his God. Focus on man and notice the pronoun his. Is it only one person being referred to? Certainly not. And bet between man and his God. Man as a species, all of us collectively call him, his, he. Genesis 6 verses 3 and 5 to 7, we see clearly that God refers to man in totality as one singular he. Now who is man's God? Can't be only the father of Jesus because we know that Jesus is also <laughs> the God of man. See, Melon White says it over and over and over, putting the very word in Jesus, words in Jesus' mouth, declaring, Jesus says, I am the Lord thy God. Jesus himself confirmed it in John chapter 20, verses 28 and 29, when Thomas identified him as his Yahweh and his God. My Lord and my God. So we know that man's God is not just the father of Jesus. We know that. But we continue. So notice now, Ellen White says, Though sin had produced a gulf between man, meaning all of humanity, and his God. His God is certainly not one person. Divine benevolence provided a plan of a bridge that would gulf Provided a plan to bridge that gulf rather. Gulf between man and his God. And what material did his God use? In the right words, I'm quoting it. Notice, a part of himself. In other words, man's God used a part of himself to be the bridge. And who is that part of God himself? We know the answer. Jesus Christ. She says it, a part of himself, the brightness of the Father's glory, who we saw in Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 3 is clearly Jesus, 
who is the brightness of the Father's glory, came to a world all seared and marred with the curse. And in his own divine character, in his own divine body, bridged the gulf and opened a channel of communication between God and man. Coming back to those terms, God, which we now realize our God is not just one person, and man is not one person, despite both can be referred to in the singular as his. She continues, The windows of heaven were opened, and the showers of heavenly grace in healing streams came to our benighted world. Oh, what love, what matchless, inexpressible love. Now it's interesting that Jesus is being considered as a part of God himself. Now, I find it very fascinating that in the same period, 1888, at the um, Righteousness by Faith Cons uh, Conference, General Conference in Minneapolis in the USA, E.J. Wagner, as he recorded in a book later, Christ and His Righteousness, he published that book in 1890, but we are convinced that much of what he spoke and, and, and preached at the 1888 conference was recorded in that book. You know what E.J. Wagner said in that book? That Jesus is intrinsically one of the constituent persons of the eternal Godhead. Completely and fully. Notice, one of the constituent persons of the eternal Godhead. That was E.J. Wagner's declaration in 1888 at the Righteousness by Faith Conference. And many of the dissidents don't take time to stop to analyze that statement. One of the constituent persons of the eternal Godhead. Intrinsically and completely. Jesus is a part of who the Godhead is. But who is the Godhead? Let now the pioneers themselves answer. I don't have to answer on their behalf. I don't have to answer on Mrs. White's behalf. I will allow them to say it in their own words. Now let's take note of Review and Herald. March 16, 1876, page 82. Here's what the pioneers had begun to teach while Mrs. White was alive. In the former dispensation, God was known by such appellations as the Lord God, the Almighty God, the I Am, the Jehovah God. But in the ordinance of baptism, according to the Gospel Commission, in which ordinance we take upon ourselves upon us the name of the God we worship. He, that means the God we worship, is known as the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now if this be truth, as it was, as it most certainly is, then it follows that to believe and confess this truth is to answer a good conscience toward God. When we are baptized in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost as the true and living God. So in other words, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, they are together. The true and living God, our creator, preserver and savior. We at once and forever renounce and separate ourselves from every kind and species of idolatry. That therefore means that according to the pioneers, we now understand our God in this dispensation, the Christian dispensation, to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just as E.J. Wagner made plain that Jesus is one of the constituent persons of the eternal Godhead, completely and intrinsically. Now, how did the pioneers understand Godhead? God had mean two th meant two things to them. It meant one, the divine nature, and it also means the divine group who together are our true and living God. There it is in front of you. 
No wonder in 1881, Mrs. White made plain the very same three living persons of the eternal Godhead. She used that expression over and over that the Father and Son are the eternal Godhead. And that is why she said that it was this eternal Godhead that was stirred with pity for the race. Councils on Health, page 222. This Godhead was stirred with pity for the race. And as a result, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves, in other words, covenanted together to do everything to save man. So therefore, the pioneers themselves start now to make us understand why Jesus is a part of God himself. Why? Because when they referred to God himself in later years, they meant, not all the time, but they meant that it was the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in unison, which is God himself. And if Jesus is among that group, then obviously he's a part of God himself. Ellen White, in referring to worshipping this God himself, notice her words in 1881. Let us Obviously, they are pioneers. Consecrate to him. She was speaking about worship of the Father. Worship of God. In the lines before, she makes plain that she was talking about worship to our Lord and our God. Let us therefore consecrate to him all that we are and all that we have. Then may we all unite to swell the songs. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father. Did she just stop there? No. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What is plain, therefore, is that the pioneers gradually started to understand that our God is a unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is why Mrs. White herself said it. And I'm going to quote you now from Mrs. White. Listing who our God is. Let me prove it. Here we go. On screen, Ellen White, Signs of the Times, June 19, 1901. Published by she herself while she was alive. Notice she said, I have inserted in brackets some explanations in blue writing for you to see on screen. But I'm going to skip over it and just read her original quote. Notice, God says, come out from among them, be separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my daughters, sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Was she only speaking of one person, despite this, that that person spoke, or, or, or that God spoke as I, and as the Lord Almighty? Certainly not. 1901. Notice Mrs. White is saying, This pledge, that mean of God to be our father, to receive us, and to receive us as Lord Almighty. Who is making that pledge? Who is that God? Next line. Straight from Mrs. White. This is the pledge of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Made to you if you will keep your baptismal vow and touch not the unclean thing. In order to deal righteously with the world as members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. Who is this king? She further explains just below. Christians must feel their need of a power which comes from the heavenly agencies that have pledged themselves. Who did she say pledged themselves? To be our father, a father to us, and speaking as God and as the Lord Almighty, speaking in a singular term, I. There she says it. This is the pledge of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And she further explains who these agencies are who are pledging to be a father to us and who speaks as our God. She makes it plain. After we have formed a union with the great threefold power, singular, threefold mean having three parts, united in one, we shall regard our duty towards the members of, the, of God's family with a sacred awe. There it is. In Mrs. White's own words. And I'm going to come up with another quote right after this. To show you that this was not a singular statement. 
But before I move on, notice one of the um, pioneering magazines of the time, The Oriental Watchman, volume 13, December 1910, page 13, picks up the same idea of the pioneers before them and Mrs. White as I quoted just above. Notice the, the, this pioneering um, magazine of SDA pioneers said there is a loose habit of thought prevalent among Christians, obviously some Christians, which so separates the gospel dispensation from the one preceding it that one would almost conclude that the very nature of the Godhead was changed at that time. In other words, the Godhead we just read about in the dispensation of Christianity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our God, the true and living God. This pioneering article is making it plain that this is not so. I continue. In the very first chapter of Genesis, we have revealed the great triune God. And we know that triune means three persons united. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It needs only the inspired interpretation of the New Testament to fill out this picture and reveal to us Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together to bring light, harmony, and order out of darkness and chaos of the beginning and passages of scriptures are quoted to support that view this is what the pioneers were teaching that our god from genesis to revelation from the beginning to now has been the god who pledged to be a father to us and who is that god the father the son and the holy spirit pledging to be a father to us. The great threefold power, Mrs. White called them. And this pioneering article calls that great threefold power the triune God. Now let me give you another quote from Mrs. White proving that when, not all the time when she speaks of God, she's speaking of the collective group. Sometimes she's speaking only of the literal individual person of the father of Jesus. But let's now look at another passage from her where she focused on the group as being our God. Here we go. On screen. Look at the bottom of the screen so you can follow along, dear listener. Here we have E.G. White in Manuscript 85, 1901. Very close to the earlier quote from her. Notice what she says. When we have accepted Christ... And in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, have pledged ourselves to serve. In the Bible, we know that serve means to worship. Jesus says, you shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Joshua told the children of Israel in, in um, Joshua 24 and verse 15, I think, that they are to serve only Yahweh and not the God's. The, the pagan gods around. Serve means to worship, the highest form of worship. So Ellen White says, when we have accepted Christ and in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit have pledged ourselves to serve God, comma. You know how many of the dissidents have never noticed that comma there? Everywhere Ellen White is speaking about God the Father as an individual, the Father of Jesus Christ. There is never a comma between the words God the Father. Because it's a title for one person. But now Ellen White is focusing on three persons. And first she started out by listing who she's talking about. And then she says, pledge ourselves to serve God. Come on. It's right there in the original manuscript. Come on. And then she lists who these persons are who make up. Who is God? The Father. Come on. Christ. Comma, and the Holy Spirit, and she describes who they are, the three dignitaries. In other words, these are royal beings of the Godhead, the threefold power she spoke of earlier. The three dignitaries, meaning royal persons, royal beings, and powers, meaning rulers of heaven. They pledge themselves. You can't pledge yourself unless you're an individual person to pledge. So she's focusing on them as individuals. Pledge themselves that every facility shall be given us if we carry out our baptismal vow. And notice, common language between 
this passage at the earlier quote where she referred to God speaking as the Lord Almighty pledging to be a father to us if we separate ourselves and touch not the unclean thing. And here now she's saying when we have pledged ourselves to serve this God. Who is this God? She stops with a comma and then lists out the persons who are this God. The Father, Christ and the Holy Spirit. They are the three dignitaries and powers of heaven who have pledged themselves that every facility shall be given to us if we carry our baptismal vows to come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. Plain. Above we see Stephen N. Haskell in the Bible Training School of 1910, a pioneer whom Mrs. White endorsed right up to her death, promoted him, asked that the brethren put him in charge of training pastors and missionaries. And yet this is what our pioneer endorsed by Mrs. White was teaching. He says, it is evident that the Holy Spirit is one of the Trinity and fully represent God, obviously represent the Father, the Father of Jesus and Christ and the Trinity, obviously the Trinity here meaning the Godhead group and appears in any form or shape or without form or shape as best answers the purpose of God. The same Stephen N. Haskell said in November 1907 of the same Bible training school magazine, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one and receive worship. Each one represents all the other members of the Trinity. That means the Trinity group. Gabriel was only an angel bearing a message from the great Trinity of heaven and could not receive worship. So we see the picture coming together that Jesus being equal with the Father is a reality from all eternity past. Why? Because he's naturally a part of who our God is. And if the Father is the eternal Father, the Son has to be there always with him to be to make the Father an eternal Father. And if the Father is always in existence as eternal Father, then by just the natural design of the Godhead, in other words, this is the reality of who the Godhead is, the Son has to be equal with the Father himself. This is what it means that it was ordained by, the, by God himself. In other words, it is a natural reality of, the, of, of, of the, uh, what, you would, what you would call the, the, the um, ontological reality. Eternal Father has an eternal Son with him always. And if the Father is there always, by him being present as the eternal father, his eternal son is always there with him. And his eternal son has to naturally be equal with him. And so that is why when the father in heaven spoke to the angels, he made it plain that this has always been the reality from the beginning. But beginning when? For the eternal Godhead. Ellen White described the father, son and Holy Spirit as comprising the eternal Godhead. Eternal meaning no beginning. In other words, from as long as the angels came on the scene and saw Jesus, who seemingly was like an angel to them, he was always, from all eternity past, co-equal with the Father. Naturally a part of the Godhead. Naturally a part of God himself. And since we now know that the pioneers understand God himself to be the group of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then naturally he's a part of that group who is together called God himself. Let's allow the pioneers themselves to give further insights. Here we see on the screen, from the Present Truth Periodical of Volume 29, 1913, page 757, the pioneers made plain the same great threefold power who Mrs. White called our God who pledges to be a father to us. And those words were the pledge of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The same God that she listed that we pledge ourselves to serve God, comma, and then list the three persons who make up that God. Notice now the pioneers are making it even plainer. God is worshipped because he is creator. And God means the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for all are mentioned as having part in creation. 
No wonder E.J. Wagner made plain that Jesus is one of the constituent persons of the eternal Godhead completely, intrinsically. Christ and his righteousness, published in 1890. In fact, it was the same E.J. Wagner. Notice at the bottom of the screen, in the 1902 Present Truth magazine, volume 18, page 83, the same E.J. Wagner says, as to the being of God, obviously it doesn't mean what the Roman Catholics mean, where these are not separate beings. No, separate beings. But the word being in the dictionary means two things. It means a personal being, personal, individual being, or, 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 or personality, and the word being also simply means an existence. Whatever that is exists is, in this case, the existence of the group of persons who make up the Godhead. So he's saying, as to the existence of God, the Godhead, and notice now he explains what that Godhead is and who the being of God is. Divinity as revealed in the Father, the Word, and the, and the, and the, the Word who is the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we Yes, they pioneers, of course, believe and teach just what the Bible says and nothing else. No man can, by searching, find out God. So his subject was God. And notice, the being of God is the Godhead. And who is the Godhead? Divinity has revealed in the Father, the Word, and the, and the Holy Spirit. Just as the present truth said above, God is worshipped because he's creator. And God means the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And since Jesus is naturally a part of who God is, Ellen White herself says, God, that means the Godhead group, used a part of that group, the a material that was, was intrinsically a part of that group to bridge the gulf between God and man. God as a group and man as a group. And I'm coming to prove to you that Ellen White also saw man as the collective term for everybody, despite referring to in the singular as his. Coming to that, but let me continue to show you that the pioneers, it was not a singular view here and there. It was all over the place. This is how they understood God. God to them meant two things. The father of Jesus Christ as an individual, and God also meant the collective group, which can be referred to in the singular as he, the true and living God. Let me continue to prove it. Here on screen, we have more proof from the pioneers of this understanding I'm explaining. Top of screen, Present Truth, Volume 16, June 28, 1900, page 411. The Holy Spirit united with the Father and the Son to create the world as he still unites with them to save each soul. Three glorious persons in one only God overall, blessed forever. In 1911, Signs of the Times, Volume 26, June 12, speaking of these three separate persons, here is what they say. Paganism, popery, of course, meaning the, meaning the papacy, and infidelity, in other words, those who are resisting the truth and, and, and falling away from the truth, like the dissidents among us, fail entirely to either rightly know or truly represent the ever-living God. It is left for pure Protestantism to proclaim to the world the true God consisting of three persons. But, here now is the clarification that they are separate beings, but of one spirit and aim. They are not one individual together like how the Roman Catholics explain it with three heads of Jesus surrounding one brain and one neck and then one body below. No. When the Bible speaks of, of, of he in the, in the collective, it is referring to separate beings. Just as man can be called a, a singular he, but is separate individual beings being referred to as collectively he. Present Truth, 1908. Jesus being a part of who God is, the person by whom God will judge the world is Jesus Christ, the God-man, the second person of the Trinity, the same person of whom we read in our Bibles was born of the Virgin Mary. Pioneers are speaking. 
There we see on screen below a quotation which I shared earlier in several other presentations and videos like these. The Godhead is composed of three personal beings. And notice, as you see highlighted in the quote, the reference to beings are as individuals. And so we have no doubt that this was a common understanding which was growing among the vast majority of the pioneers, including Mrs. White. And that is why Jesus is a part of God himself, the, gulf, the, the, the bridge that gulf the gap. The, the, the bridge that 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 bridge the gulf rather between man and his God. Now let us prove that Ellen White spoke of man in the singular, and yet it was about everybody in the human race as individual beings. Let's prove it. Here on screen, we have a quotation from Mrs. White, and at the top of the screen, you will see. The highlighted areas, she says, the true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. In the beginning, God, which we now know, is the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit speaking collectively. God created man in his own image. He endowed him with noble qualities. Could not just be the male. Everything here, everything here. Be, that is being described is describing both the male and the female. He endowed him with noble qualities. His mind was well balanced and all the powers of his being were harmonious. But the fall and its effects have pervert, perverted these gifts. Sin has marred and, and well nigh obliter obliterated the image of God in man. It was to restore this that the plan of salvation was devised and a life of probation was granted to man. It couldn't be what's one person. It has to be all of humanity. To bring him, notice the singular, to bring him back to perfection in which he was first created is the great object of life. And you may think that this is just a singular statement from Ellen White, referring to all of humanity in the singular. Let's prove that that is not the case. On screen, we have another quotation from Mrs. White, this time from Councils on Health, page 19. She says, top of the screen, Man came from the hand of his creator, perfect in organization, organization and beautiful in form. The fact that he has for 6,000 years withstood the ever-increasing weight of disease and crime is conclusive proof of the power of endurance with which he was first endowed. Now, obviously, Adam and Eve did not live for 6,000 years. So it must mean that she was referring, she is here referring to all of humanity, inclusive of our four parents, Adam and Eve, their offspring, and us today. Notice, man came from his creator, singular, perfect in organization and beautiful in form. The fact that he has for 6,000 years withstood the ever-increasing weight of disease and crime is conclusive proof of the power of endurance with which he was first endowed. Man, the image of God, is a collective group, a species, which can be referred to in the singular. And who is his God? Who is man's God? We now know. All the quotes revealed earlier tell us what the understanding of Mrs. White was, what the understanding of the pioneers around her increasing number before her death was. Our God is not just the father of Jesus. Our God is father, son, and Holy Spirit, the three that pledge themselves to be a father to us, to be the father of man. And when we pledge ourselves to serve this God, who is this God? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as you saw Mrs. White said, and the pioneers themselves confirmed repeatedly. This God will give us every facility if we keep our baptismal vows. Every facility will be given to us to conquer and be saved. And as I wrap up, let me just give you a few other um quotations from a pioneer showing you what it means for Jesus to be God himself as a 
part of the Godhead group, as a part of who God is. And thus naturally from all eternity past, he must have been equal with God. Equal with his father, who is the, the head of the Godhead group. Let me prove it to you. Now on screen you see a few other quotations. The first quotation above already addressed it. Review and Herald, March 16, 1876. This is where the pioneers started to understand that the true and living God, our creator, preserver, and savior is of course the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one united He. Now in, in, the, in the years following, notice, in 1885, Signs of the Times, May 28, 28 uh, page 326, God the Father speaks to God the Son and says thy throne, O God. Now naturally, if Jesus is our God, just like the Father, if he is God himself, just as Mrs. White described him, one of the persons who makes up the great threefold power who is our God, then it's obvious that to distinguish him between the Father, who is our God, you have to call him God the Son. Yes, he's the Son of God, but as our God, just like the Father, he's also <coughs> properly called God. But which person who is called God? The Son. And therefore, he's God the Son. The pioneers came to understand this. In uh, Present Truth of 1894, February 15, Page 101, notice E.J. Wagner, who called Jesus one of the constituent persons of the eternal Godhead. Intrinsically and completely, he's one of, 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 of those persons who make up who our God is. Notice he says, in the course of lessons as opportunity occurs, you will, meaning the persons in the school that he was addressing as a member of the board, you will impress upon the children who they teach in that school the relation in which they stand to god the father as their creator to god the son as their redeemer and to god the holy spirit as their sanctifier adventist review october 16 1900 page 664 notice the third angel's message embraces sinai and calvary the law of god and the gospel of christ so sinai represents the law of god Calvary, the gospel of Christ is represented. God the Father and God the Son. In other words, the law represents God the Father and Calvary, God the Son. And when this message ends, the work of God for the salvation of men, the mystery of God will be finished. The mystery of God is an inclusion of Father as God the Father the Son as God the Son, and of course the Holy Spirit as God the Holy Spirit. These are the words of the pioneers I'm quoting, my dear listener. This is how they understood God eventually. And of course, that is why eventually they were able to accommodate Trinitarian writings from writers outside of Adventism. But of course, writers which would not accept everything that the Roman Catholic explained the Godhead to be and the Trinity to be. And that is why, for instance, in 1890, they were able to publish a non-Adventist Trinitarian article from a Presbyterian minister called Samuel Spear. And Samuel Spear fully explained in the proper terms the biblical Trinity in that article. And that is why the Adventist pioneers published that article. I'm going to show you aspects of it now before I wrap up this presentation. And then you will see why is it the pioneers gradually came to grips with the truth that our God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let me go to that article from Spear. On screen, on the screen you see an article which was borrowed from a non-Adventist author and presented in Adventism as what the true biblical trinity is. Notice the words of this article. The Godhead makes its appearance in the great plan for human salvation. The it here refer to the group, the Godhead group. It, that group. 
makes its appearance in the great plan for human salvation. God in this plan is brought before our thoughts under the personal titles of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, with diversities in offices, relations, and actions towards men. I won't read everything, but I'll just read the highlighted points. The distinction revealed in the Bible is the basis, the distinction between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as three distinct living persons. The distinction revealed in the Bible is the basis for the, of the doctrine of the tripersonal God. This doctrine is not, notice now, this author is defending the truth of our God being three persons. This doctrine is not a system of triatheism. It's not three gods. It's three persons forming the one Godhead. This is not a system of triatheism or the doctrine of three gods, but is the doctrine of one God subsisting and acting in three persons with the qualifications that the term persons, though perhaps the best that can be used, is not when used in this relation to be understood in any sense that would make it inconsistent, inconsistent with the unity of the Godhead, and hence not to be understood in the ordinary sense when applied to men. Bible Trinitarians are not tritheists. In other words, this author continues to defend the truth that when you accept God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you're not a tri-face. You don't believe in three gods. They simply seem to seek to state in the best way in which they can what they regard the Bible as teaching. Just as the pioneers you saw earlier. Highlighted section continues. We have the distinct elements of threeness in three personal titles of the Godhead. And while this implies some kind of distinction between the persons thus designated, the language places them all on the same level of divinity. This was what the pioneers were endorsing as, as early as 1890. This same article from Samuel Spear, the Presbyterian Trinitarian author. This article published in Adventism and endorsed by the pioneers. It continues, the exact mode in which the revealed Trinity is must be to us a perfect mystery in the sense of our total ignorance, ignorance on the point. We do not, in order to believe the revealed fact, need to understand the mode. In other words, they don't have to get into the intricate explanations that the Trinitarian, the, um, the Roman Catholic Church was trying to do. You just simply accept the basic truth. Even if you don't understand the, 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 how can three persons be one God. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity, I continue, whether as to its elements taken collectively or separately. What are the elements? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So far as being a dry, unpractical, and useless dogma adjusts itself to the condition and wants of men as sinners. Article continues. I'm reading just the highlighted sections. The truth is that God the Father in the primacy attached to him. In other words, he's the head of the group, head of Christ. As every family must have a head. As we saw imaged in the family of man, made in, in God's image. The truth is that God the Father in the primacy attached to him in the Bible. And God the Son in the redeeming and saving work assigned to him in the same Bible. And God the Holy Spirit in his office of regeneration and sanctification. Whether considered collectively as one God. That means as one God in function. Or separately in relation to of each to human salvation. In other words, each person, they are separate beings. In relation to each other, separate beings. But in terms of function, they are one God. That's what the, the, the article is saying. The truth is that God the Father and the primacy attached to him in the Bible. And God the Son in the redeeming and saving work assigned to him in the same Bible. And God the Holy Ghost in the office of, re of regeneration and sanctification. Whether considered collectively as one God or separately in, rela in the relation of each to human salvation are really omnipresent in and belong to the whole texture of the revealed plan for saving sinners. Content with the real revealed facts and spiritually using them, he, that means the Christian who truly understands his God revealed in the Bible, has no trouble with them. In other words, with the revealed Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being, with, being our God. He... 
does not attempt metaphysically to analyze the God he worships. Like the Roman Catholics are trying to, 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 to analyze God as if in a test tube. But rather, thinks of him, notice him, despite it's the collective group being referred to, thinks of him as revealed in his word and can always join in the following doxology, just like Mrs. White. Consecrate ourselves to our God, everything that we have and are, we will now join as we worship that God. Praise God, the article continues, just as Mrs. White herself had originally said in 1881. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let me show you where this quotation came from. There at the top of the screen. The Bible Doctrine of the Trinity, number 90, 1890. Published by the Pacific Press as one of the articles that the Adventist pioneers published and they were fully in support of. Let me prove it to you. Let me read what's on screen. The foregoing quote explains quite nicely what growing numbers of SDA pioneers were prepared to accept and support after 1888 and long before 1915 when Mrs. White died. And it also indicates what the word tr Trinity or trio when correctly defined, truly meant to them after 1888, since they use both words interchangeably. That, that has been clear to me as I check the writings of the pioneers. They interchangeably in, in later years applied both the words trio and trinity. Because in the dictionary, basic meaning is the same. Three persons in one group. And most importantly, it indicates why the Roman Catholic version of the Trinity doctrine, seeking to explain the Godhead persons as not being personal individual beings, but rather one three-headed undivided substance or organism. Why this would forever be a problem to SD pioneers, even when they eventually accepted the basic truth about, notice, the Bible doctrine of the Trinity. In fact, it's interesting that this article that they presented from the non-Adventist author, Trinitarian author, Samuel Spear, it, the original title of it was not the Bible doctrine of the Trinity. But the pioneers themselves slapped onto it the true title. Or not the true title, their own title. Because in it they saw the true teaching of scripture. We don't understand how the unity of the Godhead um, works. We just simply accept and we don't have to get into the details as the Roman Catholics are trying to do. We just accept the basic elements of who our God is. Father, Son and Holy Spirit making up the Trinity as separate individual beings. And that is why the pioneers saw this article. An article which says we don't have to understand the mode of how this God exists. We just simply know that our God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And that is why they, 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 they proclaimed that this is the true Bible doctrine of the Trinity. That's the title the pioneers gave this article. I continue to read, in the year 1894, this same Spear Trinity article, speaking supportively of the triune God, just as the pioneers themselves came to accept that our God is triune, that article also was referring to and supporting the concept of the triune God. In the year 1894, this same Spear Trinity article, speaking supportively of the triune God, or which presented a tripersonal God and deemed and defended Bible Trinitarian does not try this. We don't have three gods. It's one God. Three persons. Divine persons, yes. But functioning together in a group as our, our one God. That article was glowingly endorsed in the following words. In the Signs of the Times, volume 20, number 29, May 28, 1894. Here's what the pioneer said of this article from Samuel Spear. This tract of 16 pages is a reprint of an article in the New York Independent by the late Samuel Spear. It presents the Bible view of the doctrine of the Trinity. Notice, the doctrine of the Trinity, not just the Trinity group, but the way the doctrine should be properly understood. It presents 
the Bible view of the doctrine of the Trinity in terms using the Bible and therefore avoids all philosophical discussion and foolish speculation. It is a tract worthy of reading and notice Bible doctrine of the Trinity. This is what the pioneers were endorsing. Once the Bible doctrine of the Trinity is properly explained, they accepted it. And so, what can I say? Jesus being a part of the Godhead. I can only put it in the words of E.J. Wagner. He is one of the constituent persons of the eternal Godhead. Intrinsically, completely. And therefore, if the eternal Godhead naturally must exist eternally, Holy Spirit, Hebrews 9 verse 14 tells us that the Holy Spirit is eternal. The Bible tells us that the Father is eternal. He's the everlasting Father we see in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, Jesus is described as the everlasting Father. We are told that he, as the Son, though begotten, exists just like the Father from everlasting Ellen White in modern language says the son just like the father exists from all eternity. Just like the father, he is self-existent. So if the father is eternal and is self-existent, if his son is eternal and is self-existent, self-existent, if they both have the same name, which means that within their own being, they are fulfilling what that name means, the I am. Jehovah, Yahweh, <coughs> then it is obvious that their Holy Spirit who represents them cannot be anything less. He has to be as equally eternal with them. And that is why in the group they are together referred to as the eternal Godhead. Mrs. White's own words. It naturally means that from all eternity past, Jesus was a natural part of who our God is. A natural part of God himself, Mrs. White said. And now we know that when they refer to God, sometimes they meant the group being referred to as him and he. And so, Jesus has from all eternity, by natural rights as being a part of the Godhead, he, because of the way things are from the eternal past, natural design of things in the Godhead, Jesus is naturally co-equal with the Father. This is why it makes plain that when Jesus came to earth, because he's of course co-equal with the Father, he naturally, and because he's our God, God in the highest sense, God overall, blessed forevermore, when he came to earth, he came to earth as God himself. Not just because he was personifying the Father, but because he himself is one of those persons who is our Father, pledged to be a Father to us. It is his own spirit that begets us, and therefore we become sons and daughters of his. And so, because he's our creator, because he is by his spirit, the one who begets us and pledges to be a father to us, just like his own father, then naturally, Jesus is equally, co-equally our God. But as man, when he came to earth as man, the condescended human being was made equal as a man with the Father. And now back in heaven, all of the counts of the Father are equal, are open between this man and the Divine Father. Counts of peace between them both. Human nature and the God nature. That's the truth. That's the truth of the scriptures understood and explained by Mrs. White, accepted and confirmed by the pioneers around her. And therefore, let us recognize that when we see passages of, of, of our Mrs. White or passages of scripture which we may not fully understand, the best thing to do is simply go back to 
the context. Read what's above, read what's below, and then look at all of the teaching of the, the scriptures or the teaching of that same author like Mrs. White, and we will better understand. So I close by saying, don't let the pioneers fool you. Don't let the, the dissidents rather fool you. My apologies. Don't let the dissidents fool you. Jesus as the man was made equal with the father. Exalted as such. Because as man he became of no reputation. And that is why he prayed to his father to have that equality he had with him. And all the powers and all of the, 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 the glory he had from eternity to be restored. Because on earth he never had it. It was held in 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 um in, in security for him but on earth he never had it he operated just like a normal man would and that is why he had to be exalted as a man he was never a man before so he could not have been exalted as a man before only as a man was he made equal with the father within time after the father said to him this day have I begotten thee as a man. And as a man he, had, he had ascended to heaven. And was exalted to equal status with the father on his throne. And that is why every time in the New Testament reference is made to God. Immediate reference is made to the lamb or to Jesus the Christ. The man. Because we want to be constantly reminded that this man is there now. Equal with the father. Because before that there was no man equal with the father. But this man is now equal with the father as our advocate at the throne. That's the truth. And from eternity. As long as God himself has been in existence. From all eternity past. By him being the eternal father. Of an eternal son. It was ordained by the natural order of things. For the son to be equal with the father simply by being the father's son, divine son. When was this? From all eternity past. There was never a point that you could say this was when it started or when it happened. Just like you cannot say the father, there was a time when he became a father. No, he was always the father because the son was always the eternal son. And always being the father, the son is always equal with him ordained by the natural order of things by God himself and the way God exists in nature that the son was equal with the father that, that means the, the individual called the father of Jesus the father of the son thank you for listening that's the truth God bless